is going to make our next presentation. He's graduating in from political science, <coughs> to my fields, in December with a concentration in pre-law and a minor in philosophy. And is trying to decide between, or among, I guess I should say, since I've added one, law school, seminary, or graduate school. Uh, and his topic is Christian Reconstruction's Complicated Relationship with the United States Constitution. So that might give you a clue why, why I asked him as one of the speakers. <laughs> So go ahead with a show of hands. How many of you, when Dr. Vile read off the general uh, introduction to my thesis, had the foggiest clue what he was talking about? That's kind of what I figured. Uh, I've described my thesis to people, and they say, oh, OK. And I say, you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Well, that's because it's a bit of a niche topic, even within Christianity. Christian reconstruction, you can probably figure out what those two words mean separately. But together, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'll explain that in just a minute after this question. How many of you would anticipate studying the Old Testament law in law school if you were to go to law school? OK, you're probably the exception to that. Uh, but really only if you go to Regent University, which is an evangelical school. Any other place, you're not going to expect to study the Old Testament law. Yet the Old Testament law of the Bible is central to Christian Reconstruction. Now, what Christian Reconstruction purports to do through the Old Testament law is to reconstruct society into a godly society. Predicated, of course, on the premise that the society we face now is a bit less than godly and needs to return back to a fundamental truth in order to accomplish true morality and to have a truly well-organized society so that people can live a good life. Touching on a few philosophical concepts there. Those will become important in a little bit. So the question that I was analyzing in my thesis is Christian Reconstruction, specifically the aspect of theonomy, inherently compatible or incompatible with the US Constitution? My answer to that is yes and no, which isn't much of an answer, it doesn't seem like, from the outset. But before we discuss the implications of that answer, allow me to explain what theonomy is. If you know a little bit about Greek, you've probably done a little bit of etymological parsing and figured out that it's composed of two words, theos and nomos. Theos meaning God, nomos being law. Old Testament law, as I mentioned earlier, you can probably guess that the term refers to God's law. So what I was analyzing is how God's law in the Old Testament would relate to the United States Constitution, being a political science major. In order to understand Christian Reconstruction, though, you have to understand it first as a theological movement. So if you want to understand Christian Reconstructionist politics, you need to understand the theology that they're working from. Now, to make this a little more concrete, if you were homeschooled, you can thank Christian Reconstructionists. Homeschooling came directly out of Christian Reconstruction on the premise that the family is tasked with the education of people. So it is not in the hands of the state to educate children. It's in the hands of the family, because the father is given the primary responsibility to educate his family in the ways of God. Thus, education is fundamentally uh, founded upon theology. The same goes in the view of the Reconstructionists for the state and law. They say explicitly that law is inherently religious. That raises a bit of a funny question when we look at the Constitution, given that it is, in essence, a humanist document. We're basing law on what people say. We're basing it on what a whole bunch of guys came up with over 200 years ago. And this is how we're going to organize a society, around what people say. Well, that's something that Reconstructionists reject fundamentally. Because they believe that if you are following humanist law, then you're following what is something that is essentially religious. And that makes the state God. Sounds kind of wacky, doesn't it? Well, in order to understand how all of that develops, let's look at the theology of Christian Reconstruction. Reconstruction is based on four fundamental theological tenets. Presuppositionalism, covenantalism, postmillennialism, and theonomy. I'll explain each of those in turn, though we won't get deep into the weeds on the theology. It gets a little uh, detailed. It's not really relevant to this, though. Presuppositionalism is a method of apologetics, which just refers to a defense of the Christian faith. So presuppositionalism holds, in contrast to the typical method of apologetics, evidentialism, that there is no neutral ground. Now, evidentialism says that in order to discuss issues of faith and philosophy with other people who do not come from a Christian basis, that there is neutral evidence in the world that we can all appeal to, that we all agree exists, for instance, the natural laws of biology, natural laws of physics, so on. And by analyzing these things in light of Christianity and showing that it could only work because of God, 
then we can draw people to a better understanding of who God is and the truth of God's existence and his imminence. Presuppositionalism rejects this idea and says that facts are all interpreted facts. So in other words, you and I can't have a conversation without having started from some philosophical basis. So that shows us that presuppositionalism is the philosophical foundation of Christian reconstruction. Without that understanding of uh, the notion that we presuppose the truth and then work from that presupposed foundational principle that we can't go past, the first principle basically, then we can work to understand the world around us. And people start from one of two different presuppositions. One, the existence and truth of God, or the other, number two, uh, we have the truth or uh, imminence of humanism, that we start with man's in autonomous reason bounded by nothing else but what he knows. Think, for instance, Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. He said that what you can know first is that he exists. The Reconstructionist says, no, no, no. You don't know first that you exist, you know first that God exists, and because of that, you exist. That plays out fairly significantly in the political underpinnings of Reconstruction because it says we cannot make law based on natural law and man's reason. We have to start from God's law. And in order to understand what God's law is, we have to start at the Bible, God's revealed character. So it's not exactly conducive to the Constitution on a paradigmatic level, as I'm sure you can guess already. So moving on into the further issues of theology, covenantalism is just about how we interpret the Bible. Do we say that the Old Testament and New Testament are discontinuous, so that we just look at what Jesus said, because that's what the New Testament focuses on, or do we look at what the law said, because that's what the Old Testament focuses on? Reconstructionists and covenantalists more generally say the two are continuous. You can't separate them. So if you want to understand how Jesus handles things, you need to understand what he says about the Old Testament first. And that will come into play in the fourth tenet of theonomy here in just a minute. For now, let's look at post-millennialism, which is just about the end times. What's going to happen and when is the world going to end? What's going to happen during that? Post-millennialism says that Jesus doesn't return to earth until after we have a godly society set up, for which we need theonomy, the fourth tenet. This, as I said, is a fundamentally theological tenet. Now, based on what I said at the beginning of this, you might guess that it would be principally political. But Reconstructionist politics cannot happen and cannot make sense unless you understand the theology first. So because they maintain that God is the fundamental truth and that we can only know truth and how law should work based on what God says, then we have to start with a theological basis. And that's what theonomy is. And then from that can the politics develop. So theonomy says in brief that the God's law of the Old Testament is the one objectively valid, continuously abiding law that should be applied uh, to current nations now in society. So there are a few different things that you have to understand in that. One is how the law treats uh, nations that were non-Jewish in the Old Testament. One particular critique says that uh, this applied only to the Jewish nation, and so we shouldn't apply it now. We need to handle something else under Jesus' reign. Uh, Reconstructionists reject that idea, as you can probably predict. Another way of looking at this says that Jesus was just talking about the law in terms of his life and patterning his life, which to the Reconstructionists means you presuppose the details of the law in the first place. So the conclusion that the Reconstructionist draws is we have to look at what Jesus says about the law to determine whether or not we apply it and how we apply it under the current economy, if you will, the current administration of God's law and of theology in general. And they maintain on the basis of what Jesus says in one particular sermon early in the book of Matthew that he affirms the law in every detail. So the question after that is not so much does the law abide, but how do we carry out the law? This makes analyzing the politics just a little bit difficult because Reconstructionists have not analyzed in great detail how we carry out the certain details of the law. If you know a little bit about the Old Testament, you're going to be afraid that if we were to have a theonomical regime uh, in the United States now, that we would see heads rolling in blood all over the streets because we'd have to execute most of the population. Depending on who you ask of Reconstructionists, that's not how things would be handled, though the death penalty is alive and well in Reconstructionist penology. Then again, that's also not really that big a revelation, pun intended, uh, inside, our, um, inside our current political uh, milieu, if you will, because while under fire, the death penalty has been well accepted in American jurisprudence for quite some time. As I said, facing some fire, but it still exists. 
The death penalty wouldn't apply quite as universally under most Reconstructionist interpretations, but that's another detail that I give just as an example of what hasn't been fully explained. But if you're a murderer, you'd still be executed. That much is clear based on what all the Reconstructionists say. There is some conflict internally, though. The bigger point, though, is that politically, based on the tenet of theonomy and based on the previous tenets of Christian Reconstructionist theology, we would have a very dramatically different society were we to apply theonomy now. Before we get too far into that, though, I want to bring up a, an incredibly important principle within Reconstructionist thought, and that is government. Most of us, when we hear the term government, probably think of the federal government, the state governments, and local municipal governments and county, that sort of thing. So what we're thinking of basically there is what we alternately call the state. So in most conversation, the state and government are interchangeable terms. To the Reconstructionist, they are most definitely not. That's not to say that the state is not a form of government, but it's only one of three principal forms of institutional government. Reconstructionists argue that the fundamental institution of government is man. Because all men are, including women of course, all of humanity, is required to govern themselves under God's law. So we start with self-government. Self-government is where you understand the law as an individual and you say, all right, I'm going to live by that law personally. You're also subject to the laws as they're carried out by the church, by the family, and by the state. Those are the other three spheres of government. So when we discuss government in Christian Reconstruction and thus how it relates to the Constitution, we're not concerned just with the state. The Constitution is concerned just with the state for the most part, a couple of things touching on other aspects, but its principal concern is with how the state is organized. So you see hinted at now another point of potential incompatibility. But in terms of how they approach government, in terms of the state, the state would be fairly limited. So getting down to the practicalities here. Practically speaking, ignoring institutional and paradigmatic questions for a moment, what we see from Reconstructionists is a state that's a little more analogous to modern libertarianism. Though not entirely, of course, because most modern libertarians reject the prevalence or imminence of religion in the first place. But in terms of actual practice, we see a much more libertarian state. Very limited, a almost aggressively, fiercely free market principle of uh, economic organization. So for instance, something like the Federal Reserve probably wouldn't exist anymore, though that's not something that Reconstructionists have analyzed in detail themselves. But the state would not be nearly as expansive or comprehensive as it is. Two significant examples of that would be the dissolution of the Department of Education and the dissolution of the various and sundry uh, Departments of Child Services or Child Protective Services, whatever it's called in each state, because those two functions, especially, would be relegated back to the family and to, to an extent to the church. So according to the Reconstructionist paradigm, the family has the principal concern and guidance over children over their, and over their education. The church has some sway in that as well, but in a different way. So the family is personally, principally, and fundamentally tasked with governing children and with governing education. So. If you're going to look at, say, public education and standardized education, that would go out the window entirely because that is seen as something that is completely contrary to the order that God sets up in the Old Testament mode of society. Take, for instance, I believe it's Deuteronomy 25. God tells Moses, who then uh, gives this to the rest of the Israelites, that each father, each household, is to teach his children and his family the tenets of God's law, and they are to symbolically bind them upon their wrist, upon their forehead, upon their heart, which the priests did literally to bring out that symbolism in a more obvious way. The idea there being that you're educating your child first to know God, and then second to know the other things about the world. Following once again on the principle that God comes first, and you can't understand anything else without God. Which also would be something of a radical change from how we approach education now. Take, for instance, removing prayer from public schools. Interestingly enough, though, most Reconstructionists don't argue that we need prayer back in public schools now. We just need to change completely how public schools operate and get rid of them, preferably. So you're not going to see much uh, in the way of, we need to return to prayer in public schools because that's going to take care of all the problems. No, no, no. The problem to them is sin. The problem is that you've disobeyed God's law. So bring back God's law and you solve the problem, right? Well, that remains to be seen in terms of how that comes out practically. That's something that Reconstructionists haven't analyzed in huge detail themselves. In fact, one of the principal writers in Reconstructionism, 
wrote a nearly 500 page book that is incredibly dense, that is incredibly detailed, just on the exhaustive validity of the law. The abiding validity of, of the law in exhaustive detail, to give the title of the first chapter. And his principal concern, as he states explicitly, is to analyze that principle, a general principle, and not the details of, what, of how we're going to carry this out. And that's still got some argument. That being said, let's look at the institutional side of Reconstruction. This is relatively simple. We have expressed in the Old Testament a basically federal system of representation. You start with elders who represent groups of tens, of hundreds, of fifties, of thousands, moving on up, and their principal concern is judicial matters. So they do some legislative work in terms of handling specifics of what to do within society. But their principal concern is with the judiciary. So looking at it in context of the classic three branches of government that we should all know, leg legislative, executive, and judicial, the judiciary plays a very strong part in Reconstructionist uh, political ideas. So in order to effectively govern society, you need an institution that's going to effectively apply the law, and that would be ju the judiciary. In terms of the other branches, it's a little mushy, but in terms of the functions of the elders, as various writers within Reconstruction analyze them, we see certain actions that the elders would take that are analogous to uh, responsibilities that the uh, Congress has now. That'd be taxation, declaring war, appointing leaders, confirming different individuals for administrative offices. So a lot of those very practical, nitty-gritty, as it were, uh, practices are something that would still exist under a theonomical regime. Similarly, the elders had executive functions. So that could easily translate into the institutional uh, setup that we have now. So in that respect, we see a fair amount of correlation between the Constitution and theonomy. And that's really about where the correlation ends. Because then we come to the issue of political paradigm. I've alluded to the very significant rejection of uh, democracy and natural law ideas that Reconstructionists hew to. And this is where one of the most fundamental uh, discontinuities between theonomy and the US Constitution comes up. Because that really goes down into two different categories, subcategories on its own. And that is the theory of law and the theory of authority. So we've addressed already what the theory of law is among Reconstructionists. And that is that law comes from God and only from God. So the corollary to that being it does not come from man. So you cannot trust what a democratic assembly says about law because they don't have the proper foundation for it. We can't trust what man's reason says because man uses his reason as a weapon against God, which sounds to a lot of people like a kind of radical statement. Uh, the theological origins of that are a little tangential to this. We won't delve into those, but that is the position that Reconstructionists take. Using your reason, you cannot come to a perfect knowledge of the truth, but God has revealed it to us, so why would you need to? You turn to the Bible and what the Bible says and how we apply that theologically under the New Testament, and there's the truth that you need to operate from. So on the theory of law side, you're not going to see an appeal to the will of the people or to democratic practices that have come through the Congress. You're not going to see an appeal to the fact that people have voted. There would be some system of voting because you need to elect elders. But the question there would not be, shall we elect the people who are going to make the law for us? But shall we elect this person to apply the law for us? Because the law is already given, it merely needs to be adapted. So could we see a congressional body there? Perhaps. But it would not be a congressional body of the kind that we countenance now. So paradigmatically, they have a little bit of an issue. On the next point, the theory of authority, there's also a significant conflict. The theory of authority that Reconstructionists hold says that the state is not the principal authority. God is the one sovereign and absolute authority. Any other authority that man wields is limited, and it's limited by the law of God. So they talk a fair amount in the literature about the lawful use of the law, the lawful use of power, which seems circular because you think, well, they make the law in the first place, don't they? Yeah, they're bound by it, but how can we talk about the institution itself being lawful or unlawful in its actions? That's because they appeal to a higher objective law that doesn't rest on the subjectivity of what man decides. Tying that into theory of authority, that means that decentralization of authority among the different spheres of government is incredibly important to understanding Reconstructionist political theory because the state does not have the power 
to intervene in the affairs of another sphere of government. Now, if you think about that for a minute, that raises some rather radical implications for how we handle things now and for potential problems that can rise within the other spheres of government. That means that the state does not have the power to take children from abusive homes, theoretically. Now, that could be ameliorated through looking at the fact that, well, a father doesn't have the right to beat his children. That doesn't fall within his lawful fatherly authority. But is that entirely clear at the outset when we're looking at the spheres of government? It seems like their view is somewhat in tension there. Not entirely clear from the analysis that's been done so far. That also raises some interesting questions on what kind of influence the church can have on the state. A lot of Reconstructionists maintain that the church is responsible to call out the state on the basis that the church, the people of God, have always been responsible to rebuke leaders who are departing from the law of God. Again, standing on the presupposed principle that the law of God is the abidingly valid and only objectively correct law. But how far does that go? And then that raises questions of separation of church and state. Well, those are addressed by Reconstructionists fairly extensively, and the difference ends up really being fairly simple. They have different responsibilities. So the church can call out leaders, but only through specific methods that are limited to ecclesiastical practices, principally preaching against what leaders are doing, maybe sending letters to leaders in, within the state to rebuke them for doing something wrong, but they can't necessarily say stage a revolution. No Reconstructionist is going to tell you that revolution is a legitimate practice. As a side note, a good friend of mine who first introduced me to this subject maintains that the American Revolution was inherently immoral and should not have been staged because it fought against a lawfully established authority that needed to be countered in some other way. So the relationships among the spheres of government are, to put it lightly, somewhat complicated. Thus my title to this thesis. It's not exactly the simplest thing ever to parse, but at the end, the basic principle of this is fairly clear. Institutionally, the two could be compatible, but only in that respect. Otherwise, the differences are too significant. And that is tied up in a lot of other critiques that Reconstructionists give of the state and of democracy in general. In fact, one of the major writers, in fact, the progenitor of Christian Reconstruction, called democracy totalitarian, which to me sounds like kind of funny because democracy is generally seen as, as far from totalitarian as you can just about get, short of anarchy. But the principle behind this is that democracy rests on the will and uh, thought of man, on reason. Whereas the uh, law of God rests upon the sovereign and immutable character of God. So if you institute democracy, all that you get is a mob rule. Similarly, the same individual by the name of R.J. Rush Juni, in case you're interested in looking him up, he critiques natural law on the basis that there can be no natural law, no natural systems without God. And to quote him, if we remove God, then all natural laws vanish. So there is no possible way, and in the quotation there, that we can talk about a common ground of natural law between Christians and non-Christians because no such thing can possibly exist. Coming back to presuppositionalism again. So, to wrap things up here, Christian Reconstruction is inherently theological, and that theology carries rather significant implications for how Reconstructionists view and interpret the politics that they wish to purvey and the politics that they find themselves within. So, that means were a theonomical regime to take uh, ascendancy, that the Constitution would in all probability be scrapped because its foundational principle of law and authority is based on something that is inherently faulty to their minds. And instead, you need to institute the law of God. Would that mean that there would be a totally radical change in terms of how we approach certain areas of jurisprudence and whether or not we have a tyrannical government? I don't think that would produce tyranny. But it would certainly produce something very different from what we know. Now, that's not to strike fear into your hearts because the number of Christian Reconstructionists in the United States, much less the entire world, is about that big. It's, it's not been a particularly influential movement from its inception, and it has lost a lot of influence on the whole. But Christian Reconstruction has had its influence, producing, as I mentioned earlier, homeschooling, and it continues in certain areas to have influence as well. It's an area that's not been studied particularly widely in uh, political science, mostly because it's a niche topic, and it's also very theologically bent. But it is a movement that is on its own merits, interesting nonetheless, because it presents a radically different view of law than we see right now. 
Could it gain ascendancy? Only time will tell. If it does gain ascendancy, look for some changes. Your head's not spinning too much. What kind of questions, Connor? Um, how close would you say, would a Christian reconstructivist say? Well, I assume Israel would be the closest thing on the planet that they would say to a theonomy. How close would they say that Israel's setup of government is to their theonomy? Do you mean the state of Israel per 1948 or back in ancient times? Post 1948. I'm not entirely certain, actually. My, what little I know of Israeli government says that it's followed a lot of the same path that most other states have. It's founded on somewhat similar principles that the constitutional structure is. It, follow, it has a parliament, as I recall. That's not necessarily something that is expressed in the Old Testament. So chances are good, just given what I know from current events, that a reconstructionist would say that, yeah, they may be Israel, but they're Israel in name only. They're not Israel in terms of law of the Old Testament. Um, I was just kind of curious because it seems like there's not much room here for like a legislative branch at all. And I think you mentioned it during your speech that the legislative branch would be almost entirely removed, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, once the law is already applied in the Old Testament uh, for Christian Reconstructionist revisioning of the American society, but um, where, how exactly does that relate to situations that you can't derive instructions from the Old Testament, like in situations with foreign policy or domestic affairs that don't necessarily apply, or, or, technology. or techno technological stuff like mm -hmm. that we can't derive from Old Testament law. That's interesting that you say that we can't derive because a Reconstructionist would critique you on the basis of your presuppositions. You're presupposing that the Bible doesn't speak to all areas of life in all ways in all of time. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that we're going to see MacBook Pros coming up in Deuteronomy. But it does mean to Reconstructionists that we can derive principles that speak to those areas. For instance, it, if you look through the laws of the Old Testament, and if you get into the theological weeds just a little bit, there are various arguments over how we determine what is applied in the same way in the New Testament and what is not. But the overarching principle is that uh, all of the law applies in all of its details. All that changes is how we carry it out. So to give an example of how we can derive a principle from a particular statute and then apply that in a different way to a contemporary context, let's take the law in, I believe it's Leviticus, requiring that all people with houses have a fence around their roof. It sounds kind of weird because you're going, well, why would you be on the roof in the first place? You might want a fence, but there's not really a place to put it because of you know, gutters. But that comes from the fact that at that time, a lot of people would sleep on their roofs because it was cooler at night and it was more comfortable. So they could sleep more comfortably and their house could air out and then during the day it would be cooler inside than on the roof. So that law was there in order to, as is put in Leviticus in my rough paraphrase, rough quotation here, was so that the bloodshed of someone at that house would not be on the owner's hands. You can derive from that a principle of uh, liability. They need to make provision against being liable uh, for someone's death by not putting up sufficient barriers and sufficient protection. So if you have a guest at your house and they fall off the roof because they thrash a lot in their sleep and you didn't have a fence, well then that's your fault because you should have put a fence there. So you can derive a principle of liability from that that could apply to say having a fence around your pool. Most people don't sleep on their roofs anymore so you don't really need to apply it in that particular way but you can still derive the principle from it. So in the same way you have a lot of laws against theft and certain laws requiring different levels of restitution depending on how much you steal, when you steal it, whether or not you give it back to somebody and the circumstances change just a little bit what the penalty is. Something similar could uh, apply to electronic money laundering. If you've stolen that money then you need to return it plus however much you took in order to make restitution to the one you stole from. So to the reconstructionist that question is essentially one without meaning because it presupposes that the Bible doesn't apply when in fact it does, it just doesn't necessarily apply in the facial way that you might expect. Does that make sense? Did you? Um, I was going to ask, uh, and obviously Christian Reconstructionism comes from Christianity, but I know Christianity is a pretty broad and various uh, umbrella. Uh, what particular faith tradition within Christianity sort of spawned Christian Reconstructionism? It would come out of the capital R reformed side of things. That can mean a variety of different things depending on who you ask. It's specifically a conservative kind of Calvinism. So part of how this developed, to give a very brief history of the theology, 
Uh, R.J. Rushdoony, the man who first started writing on the concept of Christian Reconstruction, was an ordained minister within the Presbyterian Church of the USA. After that, switched to a much more liberal uh, way of thinking and kind of theology in, I believe it was the early 1930s and 40s, he eventually severed his ties and joined the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which was also a breakoff from one of the breakoffs from PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church in America. So the Orthodox Pres denomination is rather small, to put it lightly, and is a very conservative kind of Presbyterianism based out of Calvinism. That works a little bit off of what I personally think is a somewhat spurious distinction among the kinds of law. To them, all of the law is unified in that it came from God and Moses brought it from God as a prophet to the rest of the people. So the Ten Commandments to the Reconstructionists are basically an outline in the principles of the law, and then everything else is case law that's application of those principles. So all of it applies and all of it is unified as one law. It's just a level of detail and a level of application that's different. Right, with that, I think we're going to need to end. Uh, but if you've got any questions, uh, please, please ask them after class. Thank you.